Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 13, Electromagnetic Induction. Chapter 13 introduces Faraday's law. This is the last of what we will call Maxwell's equations. This is beginning of the completion of our theory of electromagnetism, which completely describes the electricity and magnetism as we know it, complete with the interaction between them. Section 13.1, Faraday's Law, introduces Faraday's Law. And it starts out with this description of experiment that hinted at the connection between magnetic fields and electricity. I have separate lecture video of this demonstration. Please take a look. It is a very fascinating phenomenon. And this gives the qualitative description of Faraday's law. Now, the full statement of Faraday's law is very mathematical. So I want you to slow down, make sure to spend enough time understanding each pieces of Faraday's law. The first mathematical piece that you need to be sure to spend enough time is the definition of magnetic flux. You have seen flux defined in the context of electric fields and electric flux. It's defined the same way, so if you felt comfortable with electric flux, then this is similar. Now, the last context where you saw electric flux with the Gauss's law involving closed surface. Here, in the context of Faraday's law, this is an open surface, which is why it doesn't have that circle there. So, once you have magnetic flux defined, then Faraday's law can be stated in terms of the magnetic flux. It says that there is a voltage induced when you have a change of magnetic flux and that induced voltage is given by a negative of the time derivative of magnetic flux. Again, it's a highly mathematical law. One note about EMF, I have a separate thing written about EMF and why I will not be using the term EMF or electromotive force. Um, read that and I will stick to my own terminology. Now, this uh, negative sign in Faraday's law is given its own special name. We call it Lenz's law, which is a statement that helps you get that negative sign correct as you try to figure out the direction of induced current. So section 13.2, Lenz's law covers that. And it's uh, always a bit of a mouthful to say Lenz's law. Here, the textbook version says, the direction of the induced voltage drives current around the wire loop to always oppose the change in magnetic flux that causes the induced voltage. I highly recommend that you get plenty of practice. There are homework questions and other resources to help you practice application of Lenz's law. And one upside of Lenz's law is that it is a qualitative description. So I think uh, it's uh, more intuitive to apply than just to sing that negative sign on Faraday's law. So practice and hope you get it. The next section covers motional EMF or motion induced voltage. And this is the section where my lecture covers topics in different order than your textbook. The truth about motion-induced voltage is that it's nothing new. It is something that you already learned or at least can figure out from something that you already learned. This is what I mean. You have learned at the beginning of our coverage of magnetism that this is the magnetic force on a moving charge. And using this as a starting point, you can figure out what is the effective electric field on a moving conductor. And from that effective electric field or the motion induced electric field, you can figure out the motion induced voltage when you integrate that electric field over a distance. 
So in my lecture, I will start out with this to derive motion induced voltage. And the reason I do that is then that motion induced voltage gives you a motivation for Faraday's law. So in the lectures, you will see me cover the content of section 13.3 first and use that to infer that there must be something like Faraday's law. So the treatment in the textbook is clearly different treatment from what's in the lecture. And I think it's beneficial for you to see. So do take a look, compare it with the lecture, see what you can learn from it. And, and um, yeah, I highly <laughs> recommend this material. Section 13.4 covers something that we won't emphasize too much. But this is, uh, I believe, a very important material for those of you who might go into the upper division study of electrodynamics. So I will have a separate lecture video on induced electric fields and how these are really similar to magnetic fields. So do take a look at it. I don't think I'm asking any homework questions that relate to this, but this is a highly mathematical material that is relevant in upper division study of electrodynamics. So do take a look so that you have at least some level of familiarity. And watch out for that other lecture. The chapter wraps up with some applications of Faraday's law. The first application that is uh, very striking and, and has a lot of lecture demos is Edicurrent. The textbook gives some examples of application of Edicurrent. Uh, this, by the way, is used in the triple beam balance to damp the motion of the balance without introducing any actual friction that could reduce its uh, precision. So, so this actually gets used in um, everyday practical applications. Um, oh, yeah, I guess this must be where I learned that it's used in triple beam balance. Um, and I don't think it's here, but in the lecture videos, you will see two other demonstrations of eddy current using a, a neodymium magnet that moves in a copper tube. And there's a really good demonstration of uh, magnetic breaking by a guy on YouTube, and that's linked from the lecture as well. The second application of Faraday's law is the electric generator. Electric generator is the other side of electric motor. And in fact, this is why we haven't spent a lot of time talking about electric motor, even though we could have. Uh, when we covered magnetic force back in chapter 11, we actually had everything we needed to talk about electric motor. But we had to wait until now, after we have covered the Faraday's law, so that we can talk about all the aspects of electric motor. The surprising aspect of electric motor is that every electric motor is also a generator. When you look at a setup like this, this could easily be an arrangement of an electric motor. If instead of a current meter, if you had a power supply connected here that provides current, then this setup would become an electric motor. The only distinction between a generator and a motor is in a generator, you are providing mechanical work, which turns the coil mechanically and that produces the electric current. So what's the implication for a motor here? What's the implication here? The textbook describes it as a back EMF, or I'm trying to call it reaction voltage or opposing voltage. And I guess they don't have a good image of a motor with the back EMF. They have this circuit diagram, but um, let me use this diagram to briefly explain. So in the diagram here of the generator, what they are describing is a loop that's uh, spinning at some speed, angular speed omega, and how that generates a voltage that's plotted here. And what you should be aware here is that this voltage that's generated, that depends purely on the motion of the ring. So if you have this not working as a generator, 
But if you have it working as a motor, as in you have a current source connected that's going to drive the current that causes this to spin, then this voltage still gets generated. And in that context, we call this back EMF or the reaction or opposing voltage because this generated voltage will be opposing the voltage of the power supply that's trying to provide the current. So this back EMF leads to a limitation of how fast the motors can spin and it also regulates how much power motors draw. So take a look at this section. This is an interesting detail about operation of a motor and maybe an explanation of why it's uh, um, unsafe to stop a motor entirely because uh, proper functioning of a motor actually depends on this back EMF being there. Without this back uh, opposing voltage, the resistance in the motor would be too small to limit the current enough. So this is the second application of Faraday's law that the textbook discusses and the textbook ends with remaining applications of electromagnetic induction. In chapter 13, the textbook is leaving off one example of application of electromagnetic induction, which is um, inductor. We will cover that in chapter 14. Inductors are very important to electric circuits. So we will talk about that along with introduction to time-dependent circuits and AC circuits. Until next time, bye.